Hey folks, welcome. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We just wanted to thank you all so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate you being here and um, so thankful for carving out some time to join us for a conversation about the planning effort that we have going on in Mount Rainier. So before we uh, jump in uh, with a welcome um, from some folks, wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to what we're doing in this meeting and some of the logistics. So thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, we are on Teams live events for this meeting uh, so that we could host it virtually and have people join us from all over the country, which is super exciting. So you are watching a live feed. We are here live uh, to give this presentation and also to do a little bit of Q&A. So you'll notice in your box that you have a Q&A feature. So what we are going to do for this meeting is we're going to start with a presentation to walk you through where we've been and so give you some background on the park, uh, give you some background on the planning effort that we're embarking on and give you um, some guideposts about where we are in the process, what this public comment period is all about uh, and what are the issues and values that we're talking about in this series. During that presentation, we really encourage folks to submit questions as they go. We're going to be collecting them on the back end. And once we get through the presentation, we're going to be looking at the collection, the, the collection of questions, organizing them into themes, and then responding to as many questions as we can get to in the later half of this presentation. So go ahead if you have a question to start populating it into that Q&A box. And just know that if you don't see a written response right away, it's because we're collecting them and organizing them to themes and then we'll circle back on them uh, at a little bit there towards the end. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tracy to welcome us to the meeting. Hi there, welcome from Mount Rainier National Park. My name is Tracy Swardout and I am the Deputy Superintendent at the park and myself and Superintendent Chip Jenkins want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy evenings or from your dinner or time with your family and friends to get together with us and talk a little bit about the future of the icon on the horizon, Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, it's a really important time for us in the future of the park and we can't do the future without your engagement and so we're really looking forward to sharing a little bit with you this evening on how we are going about planning for the future of Mount Rainier and how you can get engaged in the process. So bear with us. We're going to run through some slides. You're going to hear from a number of different voices from Mount Rainier itself, as well as from some of our support offices across the Park Service in different states. We're all dealing with technology challenges, so bear with us if you've got troubles. Definitely chat us if you see issues with uh, the sound or you can't hear us or something's not clear, as well as keeping those questions rolling. So I'm going to kick it back over to Rachel, uh, supporting us from one of our offices out in Colorado and give us a sense of how we're going to move through the evening. And then I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about the park. Great, thanks Tracy. So the presentation that we have queued up has a couple key components to it. We're going to talk about an introduction uh, to the park and to some of the resources and values. Uh, we're gonna talk about the need for the planning effort, project goals, where we are in the process, and then how you can be involved at this stage of the process. Some of the you all have probably seen on social media and around that we are currently seeking input on this planning process. We are in the early stages and we really do need your help identifying key issues and potential strategies. So would really encourage folks to check out all the resources on the plan's homepage and the URL is there and one of my colleagues will send it through in the announcement feature as well so you can click directly on it and go straight to that. So before we dive into all of that good meat, uh, Tracy is going to jump back on here and give us a little bit of an overview and introduction to the park for those of you who may not be as familiar with Mount Rainier and its resources. Thanks Rachel. So uh, we're going to have a slide on the screen that shows you Mount Rainier National Park and uh, many of you are very familiar with the park, perhaps on the ground, but uh, Mount Rainier is in western Washington state near the cities of Seattle and Tacoma and we're surrounded by national forest land and a number of gateway communities that are really important to the park uh, and a network of state and county roads that bring you to the park. And our park consists of several key developed areas. And when you're looking at this map of Mount Rainier, starting in the upper left hand or northwestern corner, you've got our Carbon River area. 
Moving over to the northeast corner, you have our White River and Sunrise developed area. Down in the southeast corner, we have Ohanapakash and also Grove of the Patriarchs, and we have our entrance to the Stevens Canyon area of the park. And then in the southwestern corner, or the bottom left of your screen, is the town of Ashford where our Nisqually entrance is. And that's the start of the Nisqually to Paradise Corridor. And you'll hear us talking about that a good bit this evening as, as we call out some of the really important locations along this corridor. It is the most visited corridor in the National Park, and it's the 12 month access to the Paradise area. It's uh, so important that this is why we're prioritizing looking at access and transportation issues in this corridor first. Next slide. So before we dig too deep into the issues around transportation and congestion and planning, I want to talk a little bit about the unique role that Mount Rainier plays in this context of over 400 national park units around the country. So people know Mount Rainier is this uh, majestic icon on the horizon and uh, people are orienting their lives around whether or not the mountain is out. Uh, but you may not know that about 97% of the park is federally designated wilderness. And what remains, that remaining 3%, is a, a network of roads, trails, and developed areas that largely make up the Mount Rainier National Historic Landmark District. And that preserves a really distinctive style of National Park Service iconic infrastructure called the rustic architecture. People refer to it as parkitecture, um, but it's the roads that bring you to those places in the parks and allow us to achieve our dual mission in the Park Service, which is not only to preserve these nationally significant resources that you see here in the park, but to give you access to them and allow you to build connections with those resources. Next slide. So when we start talking about um, planning and decision making for national parks, we really need to base everything on the question of what is it that we're actually managing for? And the answer to that question really helps us to drive our vision and what our goals will be for the future and what our objectives will be. And at Mount Rainier, we have something called our Park Significant Statement, and we also have our Fundamental Resources and Values, and they provide for us some of that scaffolding for the planning work that we do in the future that guides how we manage everything in the park, from the day-to-day, -day, the experience when you come and meet with a ranger or go on a trail, to the long-term planning for things like transportation and corridor management, which is why we're here today. Significant statements are those things that are really important resources and values that were so important to our country as a whole that it warranted setting aside the park as a national park for all future generations to enjoy as a special place. The fundamental resources and values, on the other hand, are things that contribute to that significance. They are these rare, unique, and exemplary values um, that we are charged with protecting here and preserving at Mount Rainier. So if you're interested in more, more information about these resources, the values, why they're important, and how they really form the underpinning of all the planning and decision making that we do uh, to provide you access and experience at Mount Rainier, take a look in the chat um, and we're going to drop a link there in the Q&A box on how you can get in more information about that. Next slide. This planning effort, as we talked about, really focuses on the Nisqually Corridor. So in the bottom left of your screen, you see the Nisqually entrance at Ashford. In the upper right, uh, that's the Paradise Developed Area. The road was really um, designed to exist in harmony with the natural environment that are protected inside the park. And it provides visitors this sort of teasing glance of the mountain as you make your way up with the big reveal happening at Paradise. But all along the way are these really important on their own locations and starting points for visitors to use as jumping off points to get out into the wilderness or to experience front country trails. And some of the locations are just destinations into themselves, like, for example, the Longmire National Historic District. So all along this route, which is the most visited corridor in the National Park, are opportunities for us to improve the experience and the resources that we're protecting. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. 
Surrounding the road corridor are these remarkable nationally significant resources. And as I mentioned, these vast areas of designated wilderness, it's really the heart of the park. Uh, but again, the roads help you get out into the park. And so this planning process is going to help us address issues related to the visitor experience throughout this corridor, starting outside the corridor with the information that you get and how you make decisions on uh, coming to the park and enjoying it, as well as that experience in the line, waiting to get in, coming through the entrance station, all the various places that you might stop along the way, and then get to your final destination, whatever that might be in the park. We have a really helpful story map that our folks have put together that you'll also see a link to in the Q&A uh, so that you can go through and explore some of this corridor on your own after this call. Uh, next, I'm going to pass it over to Rachel and talk about, so why do we need a plan right now and what are we seeking to achieve? Great, thanks, Tracy. So I'm gonna dive into some of that information about the need for the plan, the issues driving it, and where we're going next. So when we think about a need for the plan, one of the things that we have ex observed over time is this dramatic increase in visitation to Mount Rainier National Park. The plan is really needed to meet those changing needs of park visitors and to make sure that we're supporting positive visitor experiences in a very sustainable manner. Uh, as you guys can see from some of the content on these slides, that the visitation has really increased over time. Most of this visitation occurs within those summer months that are most popular. And within those summer months, there are a few key areas in the park that tend to be very popular. And so we get these increases in visitation. You can see here, even just the July visitation has a very notable increase over time. And so what we want to be doing is making sure that even with these increases in visitation, we're still providing really high visitor experiences and we're really providing for resource protection goals. So as we've embarked into this planning process, we have started to de um, define some key issues. And I wanted to take an opportunity to walk you all through what some of those key issues are that are really bringing us to the table for this conversation. The first one is roadway congestion on Highway 706 and on Paradise Road. Uh, this roadway congestion is frequently observed along these roadways um, as well leading up to the Nisqually entrance and also at critical points within the park. And this high demand uh, for use of the roadway leads to congestion and sometimes competition for parking at trailheads and other locations along the corridor. Also, uh, coming along with all of this is we want to be providing for a really high quality visitor experience at scenic viewpoints and along the trails. For those folks who know this corridor, there are some really, really great recreational resources along this corridor. Uh, the high visitation uh, sometimes can create competition at those locations. We want to make sure that we're continuing to provide an opportunity along with strategies to ensure those high quality experiences and enjoyment at all of these locations. As people get to destinations, uh, they sometimes can encounter high competition for parking uh, as well as congestion at facilities. And especially during these summer months, this can result in cars parked along the roadway um, and also just a lot of people trying to use a limited amount of space. And so we want to think about how might we pace that? How might we reduce the amount of competition for some of those resources? And how might we make sure that when people come to these locations, they're provided and welcomed with a really high quality experience that's consistent with our resource protection goals. As we move through that process, we want to be really intentional and thoughtful about context. And so, as Tracy mentioned, the roads that are in this corridor are critically significant cultural assets, not just to Mount Rainier as a park, but to uh, the National Park Service as a whole. And so we want to make sure that whatever solutions we're sourcing as a part of this effort are consistent with the historic integrity of this roadway system and with the natural resource context that we're presenting. So one of the other things that we want to be paying critical attention to as well is that we're trying to minimize 
um, and mitigate any impacts to alpine meadow environments and other natural resources. So when we're looking at these mid to high elevation ecological communities in Mount Rainier National Park, those communities are critical to park significance. And so we really want to be sure that as we welcome people to those locations uh, that have amazing wildflower views, that have great views of Mount Rainier and just phenomenal photo taking opportunities that we're also providing that access in a way that is consistent with our resource protection goals for sensitive subalpine vegetation, soils, aquatic resources, and the wildlife that depend on those environments. As we enter into this process, we're also really curious to know what are you experiencing at Mount Rainier? What are the issues that you are seeing that interfere potentially with your ability to experience the corridor? What do you value about your Mount Rainier experience? What are those things that bring you back over and over again? Or what are those things um, that you've seen or experienced that might interfere um, with your ability to access or enjoy those resources. Those, we want to hear all of those things. And we have been diving into the correspondence and reading through those correspondences and loving all of the content that we're getting in that. So we wanna really encourage people to continue to let us know what does your Mount Rainier experience look like in this corridor? And what would you like it to look like in the future? Those are some critical questions that we would love your perspective on as we enter into this conversation. So I wanna turn our attention to talking a little bit about project goals. What are we hoping to achieve in this process that we're embarking on currently? This plan really at its core is about planning for our future so that we can sustainably accommodate our visitation and still provide that really high quality recreational experience, Mount Rainier experience that y'all have come to know and love. This proactive planning for use of this corridor really helps us provide access, improve experiences, and protect resource conditions and cultural values in the corridor. This proactive planning also gives us a great opportunity, like we're experiencing right now, to engage with stakeholders and the public about what does your Mount Rainier experience look like and how can we leverage strategies to help improve that experience. We wanna be coming up with strategies that are flexible and scalable to be improving access to your public lands while ensuring that we protect the resources that make those quality experiences possible. So some of our expected outcomes for this is to develop a suite of strategies that help us meet our goals, help us protect those fundamental resources and values and help provide a high quality experience for Mount Rainier visitors. We understand that these issues are very complex and there's gonna be no single solution that's going to address all of the issues that are in front of us for this planning effort. So we need to be thinking about not just the issues and the strategies as one-to-one -one relationships, but the relationships between the issues, the relationships between the strategies and how the strategies might be able to work together to provide an improved experience and improved resource protection. So again, it's coming up with what is that combination of strategies? What does that larger future vision look like to guide future management of Mount Rainier National Park in this corridor? So one of the questions we get a lot at this stage of the planning process is, what are you considering? Uh, and we're considering a lot of things right now, but we really also wanna consider what you guys um, have and what your ideas are. Uh, so we want to be thinking about all ideas that could currently be considered and explored, and we're inviting you into that brainstorming process with us. So some of the things that we really wanna encourage people to think about when we're suggesting strategies is, what are potential seasonality and timing of those strategies? Do we need that strategy all the time or just certain seasons or just per certain parts of the week? Who is the target audience for that strategy? Is it really intended for day users or overnight users? How might that strategy interact with the cultural and natural context of the park? How might it impact those resources? How might it help us work towards our resource protection goals? How might a strategy help us think about accessibility and accessibility improvement? How might it improve visitor experiences? We also are thinking about how might those strategies interact with communities? And also how 
my strategies help us towards operational and financial sustainability. So we want to be thinking about where are those strategies going to interface on the ground and how do we make sure that we can sustain those strategies for the long term. So that gets us through what we've identified for as issues, where we're going with project goals, and then wanted to also let folks know where we are kind of in the big picture. So we said we're inviting folks into this process very early to talk about your Mount Rainier experience. What do you value in this corridor? What issues are you seeing? Um, and how might we start to think about that brainstorm of strategies? Once we kind of get through that phase, we're gonna take all of that information, distill it down and start to explore solutions and really think about what strategies, concepts, combinations of strategies might work well together. Um, what might that future management frame look like? And then we're gonna come back out to the public and say, here's some of the ideas we heard from you. Here's some additional ideas. We'd love some feedback on those strategies. We'd love some feedback on those ideas. And then we'll move into kind of the third phase of putting a plan together and working through the processes of looking at the bigger picture impacts of any of those specific strategies. So again, we're just at the very beginning of this process and are so excited to have so many people along to join us in these very early conversations as we start to envision the next steps uh, for this corridor. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy uh, to have her give us a little bit of information about what your role is in this process right now that we're engaged in. Thanks, Rachel. So clearly we've talked about how we want to hear from you. Uh, we know that you all experience Mount Rainier differently. Some of you are hardcore hikers and backpackers, and some of you uh, like to enjoy a glass of wine uh, by the fireplace in the Paradise Inn, and um, everything is a valuable Mount Rainier experience. So we really want to hear from everyone. And so between August 10th and October 5th, we want you to engage in this planning process. It is your national park after all. And uh, this is just the first of many opportunities. So this is kind of the brainstorming phase where all ideas are good ideas. Then in later phases, we'll be putting back to you some strategies and asking you for feedback. So this is definitely not your last opportunity to get involved, but it's your earliest opportunity to get involved. The information that we gather from you through this planning process is going to inform our decision making and then our priority setting for how we invest your tax dollars, the public funds, uh, over the next decade at Mount Rainier. And there are lots of different options. Um, and I know that we're gonna hear from uh, some folks. We've got some questions already coming in about uh, some ideas, but we definitely want to try to capture all of your ideas and we'll, and we'll share with you how you do that. Uh, coming in. Next slide. Thank you. So um, when you are communicating with the park about your ideas uh, and things like that, it's really easy to kind of jump ahead to solutions. But um, we ask you to take just a moment and think about some of these uh, comments to try to help give us as much of a, a detailed piece of feedback as you can. The first one is, what are the experiences that you find most important? Kind of start with that. You know, how are these experiences really unique from other experiences that you have in the rest of the park versus the Sinsquale Corridor? Um, how these differ from Forest Service experiences or some other parks, state parks? What are the kinds of experiences, not only that you find most important, but what are the kinds of experiences that you hope, if you look 100 years in the future, that our future visitors and generations will have when they visit Mount Rainier? What are those just sort of quintessential Mount Rainier experiences and how do we provide those? The second issue we'd like you to think about is what are the things that interfere with your desired park experience? You know, we've already gotten a couple of comments, people saying traffic interferes with it. Well, that's just one, there could be others. Um, and so we ask you to, when you're providing your feedback, make sure that you share with us what are the barriers to your desired park experience. Um, next, we want you to think about what are the strategies? So this is like the creative part. I know everyone wants to go right there. What are the strategies that you want us to consider when we're brainstorming transportation and visitor experience solutions? Um, in, a, in a first look at the feedback, we know a lot of people are really passionate about shuttles and we're going to ask you kind of to hone in on that, you know, 
Who are they for? What is the season? All the things that Rachel was talking about. Is this something you see on the weekends? Are you talking about just a shuttle that would move people around from Cougar Rock to Paradise? Be really specific about um, what is the experience that you're trying to preserve? What are the things that are preventing you from having a good experience now? And then sort of what are the strategies that'll get us there? And then lastly, uh, we hope that you also share with us the things that we're doing that are working so that we can continue those. Um, we want to shore up the things that are working and maybe peel away some of the things that aren't working. And both of those are really valuable pieces of feedback that we can get from you. So we really want uh, to hear from you. So uh, I'd like to introduce Darby Robinson, one of our amazing uh, Interpen Ed Rangers here that we have in the park. Take it away, Darby. Hello, thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you all for um, attending and asking your questions. So let's jump right in, okay? Our first question is educating the public, i.e. visitors, in outcome of this planning process, or is this process focusing on the corridor improvement only? As a volunteer at Mount Rainier, I find the visitors may not be very well informed. So maybe Rachel, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, I'll start by saying that educational strategies are absolutely part of the suite of strategies that I referenced earlier that we want to be considering in there about how might we go about improving education. But I also wanted to ask uh, Terry from the Interpretation Division to speak a little bit towards educational strategies as well. Great. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and thanks for that question. So my name is Terry Wilde. I work at the park in interpretation and visitor services. And so one of the main focuses of our operation is educating um, the visitors. That's not a specific outcome that we're looking for for this effort. We are looking for folks to, to maybe comment on their park visit and how what's important to them and, and how we can improve that element of things. However, we do always welcome um, more ways to communicate in general to anybody um, who would like to seek information on the park. So they can always provide us feedback through our uh, more information email, and we'll be happy to look at our operations and see how we can improve. Um, but this particular effort, we're focusing really on the transportation plan. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, okay, so next question. How, this is going to be a question for Rachel. Uh, have other parks gone through a similar process and are there lessons learned uh, from those that we can draw on here at Mount Rainier? Thanks, Darby. There absolutely are other parks who have gone through a similar process and we are actively drawing on the lessons learned from those different processes and different experiences. This is one of the um, if I'm honest, one of the best parts of my job is getting to leverage some of those national best practices that we have, both from our agency and also from collaborating with other federal land management agencies. And then what we want to do is take those lessons learned, take those best practices and apply them to the Mount Rainier context. We really want to make sure that every park is, we know that every park is unique. And so we want to make sure that the solutions that we're sourcing and the process we're doing is sensitive to that context. Um, and makes sense in that context because um, a solution that works really well at one park might not really work in the context of another park, but we want to be thinking about why that solution works and what are some of the underpinnings that might help us be successful in future efforts. And so there's a number of efforts that are like that that are completed and ongoing currently and we're actively coordinating with those folks to make sure that we're pulling all the best lessons learned forward. Um, I'll just take a quick pause. Anyone else uh, from the park have thoughts? on that question before we move on to the next one. Okay, Derby, I think we're good. Thanks, let's move on to the next okay. question. Excellent. Um, we have a question for Tracy. Uh, have you considered and or is it feasible to increase staffing during the peak months? Um, yeah, so that's that's a kind of a popular question in this is, you know, thinking is there a, a way to have other MPS staff come on for three months to help provide uh, people that component to mitigate the damage in the alpine environment, so seasonally. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a really important one. I know a lot of people that, you know, they see the rangers out and they think, well, you should just get, get some more of those folks and the flat hats and put them out there. Um, really important. So we have about 100 permanent employees at Mount Rainier, but we have 
up to 200, sometimes more than that, seasonal employees that join us. Some join us for the winter season to help out with visitor experience then, uh, and we have a lot. We more than double in size during the summer months, so we do actually bring on a pretty a uh, pretty big seasonal workforce um, and you've seen many of them deployed out there at the entrance stations, uh, working in custodial work, performing projects for the park, uh, doing uh, walks and talks uh, this summer, being outside the visitor center. And then in addition to the paid staff and uh, both uh, permanent and seasonal employees that we have, the seasonals being mostly folks that we bring on in the summer, we also have a really healthy uh, group of volunteers and you may have seen meadow rovers out in the park and so we do utilize those meadow rivers to get out there and help folks understand how to recreate responsibly on our trails and to understand the guidelines around dog use. I see some comments that have come in about dogs. This has definitely been a summer where we've seen a lot of folks with dogs on trails not knowing about that. Um, but yeah, so we do. We do bring in a lot more people. Um, one of the things that uh, we have done this summer is we have increased some of our trail roving to try to get out there and assist uh, where people are and bring the information to them rather than kind of being right at the, the visitor centers. But you know, through this planning process, one of the great things that we can get from you is new ideas about how we deploy staffing um, and how we share information with the public about how they can visit in a way um, that will not take away from other people's visiting experience. And so we definitely encourage you, if you have ideas about seasonality of staffing, what kind of staffing, you know, is it you want to see people at the entrance gates or you, you'd like people to just tell folks which trail to get on, that sort of thing. And then tying it back to this idea of uh, traffic and congestion and then kind of again appealing back to that what is the experience that you're really trying to promote with this use of staffing because staffing is certainly a tool um, that we can utilize so thanks for that question okay so let's uh let's keep it rolling um I have a couple of questions about reopening certain areas or potentially ex expanding uh access so this is a question for our superintendents tracy or chip uh, i want to take this one are there any plans to reopen carbon river and or west side roads in order to decrease traffic on the longmire to paradise corridor the nisqually corridor so what about carbon river or west side roads so i'm interpreting this question um a couple of different ways one of which i'm interpreting this question is asking the question of is it possible to meet the increasing levels of visitation by distributing people over a broader landscape? And I think that as part of this planning pr process, I think that's exactly one of the things that we are interested in exploring with folks. And I think we are interested in hearing from you, um, people who are interested in the park of, it is, is that something that is a viable outcome? Is that something that's an interesting solution? And Part of distributing one of the interesting things about Mount Rainier is, is that you can experience Mount Rainier. You can get spectacular views of Mount Rainier, both from inside the park, as well as from a much larger landscape outside the park. And so should it be something that we are pursuing is looking at create, working with partners in other organizations, the Forest Service, private landowners, other organizations um, to pursue um, uh, uh, tactics of helping to try to distribute people over uh, a broader landscape and what might that look like. So that's part of the, I think that's part of the question that's being asked. The other part is very direct about carbon is will people have access to carbon? First of all, yes, the Park Service is committed. We will continue to be maintaining access to the carbon area. Um, access to being able to drive to the current trailhead and from there we'll be maintaining trail access so that people can be able to um, hike into the park. But no, we are not looking at restoring vehicle access further into the park. Um, it simply is not financially or ecologically feasible given how dynamic the Carbon River is. It is a river whose stream bed is um, uh, uh, rising and we're going to continue to see increasing flooding and erosion there as time goes by. And it is just not financially or ecologically <coughs> feasible in order to be able to um, maintain vehicle access further up the carbon. As far as West Side Road, that's a great question. And since the West Side Road connects with the Nisqually and Par uh, Paradise Road corridor, I think we're really interested to hear what people have to say um, about uh, um, currently we have access there on foot and uh, bike. 
uh, whether we should be looking at taking financial resources that could be used in terms of maintaining other access in the park and moving those to where it's trying to um, having other kind of um, uh, access, vehicle access on the on the West Side Road and what people feel about um, seeing about what that would mean in terms of um, distributing larger number of people over the um, uh, over that part of the uh, landscape again and what that would mean in terms of changing uh, changing the quality of the experience there. So we're interested to know what people have to think about that. Darby. Excellent. Yeah. Um, OK. The next question is for Rachel. Have you determined a maximum capacity for the Nisqually Corridor, cultural sites, trails, views, et cetera? Yeah, so that is a great question. Doing that analysis to be looking at visitor capacity is a part of this planning process. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at and including as we continue to go forward. So to help us out as we go into that process, what we'd love to hear from folks as they submit their comments is, what do you value about the park and what are your desired experiences when it comes to experiencing resources, uh, recreational opportunities, what do those de desired resource and experiential things look like? What do they sound like? Some um, information from y'all about what do you hope to see from that experience will really help us as we kind of move into that next phase analysis. The other thing I wanted to jump on as I'm seeing in uh, the Q&A, there are some really great ideas um, about potential permutations or different combinations of shuttles. It's so exciting to see all of the diversity of brainstorming that can happen when you get a large group of people together, which is one of the reasons I love doing these meetings. I would really encourage folks to think about some of those parameters that were on a previous slide about seasonality and ridership and um, timing and all those kinds of things and think about of your dream shuttle system, what would that look like? And go ahead and submit it to us on Pepsi. Submit it through the comment portal and let us know what that looks like. Um, we'd love to hear all of those ideas. Um, and so we'll go ahead and drop that link to where you can submit comments into the Q&A box as well so folks don't have to go digging for it and it can be fresh right in front of you. Thank you. Excellent. Hey, hey Darby and uh, hey Darby. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wanted to, to piggyback on something that Rachel was saying there about shuttles um, and being um, even uh, uh, more direct in some of the questions. So I think um, uh, we do, uh, uh, people are suggesting, hey, we'd like to see a shuttle at Mount Rainier. So some things that I think we're really curious about when people suggest that. Um, so some things, to some things building on Rachel is, are you suggesting that you would prefer to leave your car someplace outside the park and ride a shuttle in? Are you are you suggesting that you would prefer that all cars be banned from Mount Rainier and everybody has to ride in a shuttle or do that seasonally? Are there um, are there, as Rachel said, are there other permutations of that um, that you're that you're suggesting or another way of thinking about it? Right. Is what's kind of the problem you're trying to solve? Do, do you believe that there are not um, that there's more capacity and that actually we could support more visitors at Paradise. So everybody should be allowed to drive in. And on top of that, we should also have shuttles bringing people in. Or are there um, other variations or permutations? We need to hear from you in terms of what you're thinking about that. Thanks, Darby. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chip. Uh, okay, next question. Um, Tracy, if you'd like to take this one. Where is the funding coming from this for this project? And do you have an idea what your budget will be to implement proposals? Money questions. So, yeah, the, the money questions. So uh, it's kind of a couple different things, kind of getting my thoughts together here. So the first part is um, where did you get the money for this process? And um, so we do have federal appropriations that come in, obviously, to manage the park. And we also have federal appropriations that come in for projects, like one-time initiatives to build something, fix something, and in some cases to do planning. And that's the case for this, and that we receive project money uh, through a federal appropriation to support the planning work. And those um, those are competed nationally, and so this this project competed against other similar projects around the country, and it was really important, so it got prioritized and it got funded. When it comes to the funding of implementation of solutions, that's really interesting. I think um, 
we have funding for projects. It depends on what the project is and what the scale is, whether or not we can invest certain amounts of money in certain kinds of projects. And you know, one of the things that Chip mentioned was you know, the West Side Road access. There is an amount of money that you can invest to do any number of things, any number of solutions, you know, whether it's widening roads or adding additional access points, all sorts of things. Um, the question then becomes, which is your priority action? So what we're anticipating is that coming out of this uh, set of um, planning exercises that we do and the resultant documents, we'll come up with a set of solutions that we can implement. We anticipate some of them will likely be shorter term implementation and some of them may be longer term. Um, and so we will then compete for funding as we do for every other kind of project in the park. A lot of times for projects like this, we're able to use the fee revenue that's generated from the entrance gates. Uh, you'll hear us refer to that as Floria funding. It's the recreation funding that we get when visitors come and they, they pay their entrance fee. And so that kind of funding is something that we use not only for implementing transportation strategies that we might have, whether it is a shuttle or whether it's developing different kinds of ways to manage uh, congestion at our entrances or in our developed areas, or whether it's putting a new uh, roof on a building. So all of these are kind of coming out of some of the same pots of funding, but absolutely. Is there a separate bucket that's specifically for things that come out of this plan? No, but um, there's not really a separate bucket for any of the things that we do. So it's all a matter of prioritization um, of what are the things that we can try to tackle over the next few years and then which are the things that we need to try to just make progress on longer term. But thanks for the question. The funding. Hey, part. Tracy, uh, can I can I Tracy, can I add on to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, so um, um, some people are familiar with uh, transportation solutions that exist in other parks like Acadia or Yosemite or Zion, right? Uh, Glacier. So in just about all of those examples, the funding, um, uh, there's funding for capital, like what does it cost to buy buses? And then there's funding for operations, how you pay drivers, how you put gas in, how you maintain it. Um, in almost all of those, um, the funding of those systems are done in partnership with local communities and states. And so it's actually the um, Park Service puts in some funding, um, as well as the states and the local communities put in funding, whether that is through their local transit occupancy tax or other revenue that's available to those local communities. And so I think it, it, depending upon the solutions or alternatives that we are looking at through this planning process, it may require all of us, including those of you that are participating in this, uh, in this uh, uh, call, um, to work collaboratively in terms of trying to figure out the solutions in terms of what sustainable, so, uh, su sustainable implementation looks like, marrying up resources from many different sources. Thanks. Awesome, thank you guys. Uh, let's let's stay with Tracy. Um, so we have a, some questions about other areas of the park potentially wanting to be addressed. So um, we have a question about why is Sunrise or White River access not as high demand from Seattle? It is faster to get there than to Nisqually. And in a similar vein, uh, another question is about basically could this could focus on one side actually increase demand and and uh, kind of um, congestion in an area like Sunrise, White River, or in Packwood? Yeah, these are really important. Uh, if you pick out one thing, you find it's connected to everything else. Um, clearly, we're managing um, visitation across the whole park. Um, prioritization wise for something that we could bite off and, and try to uh, help get some resolution on as an early win. This Nisqually to Paradise corridor is the only kind of 12 month access route up to Paradise. And because it's used by such a large portion of our visitors, it made a lot of sense to focus on it first. We do anticipate that many of the strategies that we are developing for use in this corridor are things that will also provide um, options for us in places like Sunrise and White River. I will say that in this summer, uh, the backups at Sunrise and White River have been extreme compared to prior years. We've often had the situation where on Saturdays and Sundays between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. we're having to meter folks in to Sunrise and White River. Um, it was stretched out to longer periods of time uh, and starting earlier and those lots are filling incredibly early in the morning. So certainly 
uh, we expect that some of the solutions that we come up with will be solutions that we can employ for other areas in the park. Um, and there's kind of no end to the amount of things that we can look at as far as access in the park. Even though this is our, our big focus right now for trying to develop a set of solutions that the public is bringing to us and that we've evaluated in terms of whether or not they're going to work inside the park and be feasible and be something we can do. Um, our eye is also always on access to every other area in the park and Chip has talked about some of those. Uh, the West Side Road, ensuring that we continue biking and uh, foot access and, and maybe something expanded and, and we're looking forward to getting your feedback on that. Carbon River Road, many people know that access there is a challenge because of flooding and if you go up there right now, you encounter a giant hole in the road right outside of the park entrance, which kind of shows you the power of the Carbon River. Um, but uh, Sunrise and White River don't really have that, but what we have instead is uh, some access challenges on 410 and 123 that present longer term um, access uh, po possible barriers to access in the future. But we won't stop ourselves with this corridor, but this really is the most important corridor for us to focus on first. Um, and understanding that, you know, as we move forward, we will take in turn looking at some of the other corridors into the park. When you're talking about solutions that you bring to us, one of the things that we'd like you to think about and address if you can in your comments is how you anticipate those solutions will or will not have an impact on other entrances. Um, you know, we know some folks have suggested things like timed entry. Uh, well, timed entry, is that something that you'd want to see across the entire park? Uh, is that something that you see pushing people to other places? Um, if we require shuttles and didn't allow vehicles, what would that do to surrounding forest lands? Um, and so we're asking you to provide that kind of context when you're providing your suggestions. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Okay, this question, we're, we're coming to the end. So we, we do have maybe time for like two more questions live, but we will have uh try to get to even more but so this is for rachel we want some positivity here do we know any success stories from other highly trafficked national parks who have had to deal with similar issues oh my gosh so many so many i don't even know where to start on this one um but i think we've seen just a lot of folks service-wide that have really said that by being proactive, um, it's really put them in a good spot to be able to really understand changes over time. And so I think about um, that a lot of parks that have instituted monitoring programs where they say, this is what we're watching for. These are the kind of indicators of quality that we've established. Um, and this is how we know and communicating that is super effective. Um, I actually worked on the Acadia plan. So that one's near and dear to my heart um, and the success is there. So they're actually going into implementation soon. Um, I think that that's a really good story of how to really look at something that's context sensitive about looking at a solution that's really going to enable people to better plan their trips. I think one of the things I loved about looking at um, how they're gonna manage access going into the future is it's also providing a really critical planning tool for people to be able to plan their recreation. I think one of the big reflections for me over the last couple of months is watching how much people value national parks and public lands and how important those experiences and resources are to our overall kind of health and well-being um, as a community and as a society. And so any tools that we can do to give people more resources, to know what to expect, to plan for a high quality experience, um, to really engage in that in a meaningful way, whether they are from next door or five states over, I think is an awesome success story. And I would encourage folks to check out other plans um, on national park websites to, to look at how they've implemented those things. I know that people would have loved a list of parks, but I just, I, I can't pick favorites. It's too hard. <laughs> And uh, Darby, I wanted to answer. I know some people have, you know, questions about what about prior planning uh, efforts in the park, and you know, didn't ha haven't you been talking about this for a long time? And it's true, absolutely. And you saw some of the stats earlier that we've had about a thirty percent increase in visitation in the last ten to twelve years. It's 
46%, you go a few years back and it's 50% increase. Um, and so a substantial increase um, in visitation and in patterns of visitation and in the focus times of that visitation since some of our earlier, for example, our general management plan. Um, but, you know, vehicle congestion has been an issue at Mount Rainier. You know, our, our curatorial staff will pull out pictures and show you, um, you know, as being one of the first parks to allow vehicles in, congestion is not a new thing for the park, but the level of congestion that we're having has really taken a, a big peak. We've known that this is an issue that we're going to need to bite off and chew, and now's the time for us to make some real progress on it. So we don't want people to be dissuaded by the fact that it's something that we have looked at in the past, um, but we're hoping to inform it um, through this public process uh, between now and October 5th to get your ideas, to come up with a set of strategies that are things that we can uh, and in fact must implement to preserve both those resources that we're trying to preserve and that visitor experience that we're hoping to keep in a high quality. All righty, thank you everybody. We have time, we're gonna have one more question uh, live and then we'll do a little wrap up. Um, so this question actually probably pretty important because I we've gotten so many good questions. It seems like everybody watching has been super active. So thank you. These are only as important as you are active. So thank you so much for that. So we have a question about, uh, are we going to have another town hall or meeting that we can attend? And uh, how do we get a hold of folks that are are holding the meeting? So how will people find out about this? So uh, Chip, do you want to do you want to handle that? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, you, you you know we are. Um, it is absolutely critical that we continue to have your involvement as we move all the way uh, uh, through all of this. And so, um, just as we have done in terms of trying to set up this meeting, we will. You should see um, similar things going forward, which is, uh, you know, we will have active social media posts. We'll be having stuff on our website. We will be um, having newsletters. We'll be handing stuff out in the uh, in the park. By the easiest least level of effort way for you to be informed about what's going on is to um, track Mount Rainier on our social media accounts. Um, we make announcements on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook routinely, and that we will continue to do. Um, is that covered, right? Is that what you needed? Or Rachel, anything else? Yeah, and we actually did have, I, I lied, there's actually going to be one other question for Rachel here, which cut, but it ties to it. So it's 1A, 1B. That's it. I'm not, that's not a full lie, just a small fib. But for Rachel, <laughs> re the phase two in the public review, is there a proposed date for this review? And so basically that next phase, what's, what, what can you tell us about that? So I, we don't have um, hard dates for that next phase because it really depends on what we hear in this process. Because one of the things that we want to do is all of the brainstorming that y'all are going to do and share with us and all of the input and the strategies, we want to take some time to put some meat around those, do some vetting with them, kind of roll out some of, like think about what the context of some of those ideas might be before we come back. Um, so we give you something else to respond to, which is um, I think it'd be super fruitful. So. I would say in uh, in addition to what Chim or what Chip said, we do want to keep things moving along. You'll always see stuff on the social media pages. Also bookmark the planning um, homepage. Uh, I think Kelly's going to push that through as well. So you'll see that coming through from a moderator uh, about um, what all the planning updates that'll be coming there. Um, I would say big picture, you know, we're really hoping to be able to come back sometime in the spring or early summer um, with the next phase. Um, we know that addressing these issues is important to folks. And so we're putting a lot of time, energy and attention to getting through this process just as quickly as we abs as we can, um, while also making sure that we are being really thoughtful in our process. So just in terms of wrapping it up, I know uh, Chip's got some technical difficulties. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who has taken the time out of their, their lives to spend some time with this because clearly you care about the park, but go around and tell other people about this opportunity to engage. Um, we're really charting the course for what the future of uh, you know access and vehicle use is going to look like at Mount Rainier. And so it's an important issue for all of us. Um, we really want to try to keep these visitor experiences high quality 
and don't allow the resources to degrade in the face of uh, the visitors who want to get access to the park. Um, this is how you engage with us to help us make the right decision. I encourage you, if you're really interested in this kind of topic, uh, to go and do a little bit of research on your own and look at what's been employed at parks around the country. Uh, get a sense of what that might mean in a Mount Rainier community with the kind of roads that we have coming into the park, the kinds of visitors that we have coming to the park, what the population is doing in the Puget Sound, and envision, if you will, what you want it to look like in the future and make suggestions that you think will get us there. Um, we really don't have in our mind, this is what the perfect solution is going to be. There are a lot of good ideas and each one comes with its pros and its, and its cons. Um, and we know that, um, but now's your chance to get involved in the future of Mount Rainier. So thank you in advance and we look forward to hearing from you again.